Hi everyone, welcome to our live stream for the biology paper one. So what we're actually going to do then is go through mainly for OCR gateway. But for those of you that do AQA, then the good news is that a large amount of this is actually the same. So we're going to go through all the stuff on cells, microscopy, enzymes, all of that kind of thing. The only bit that we won't cover for those of you doing AQA is the diseases part. So let's start off then with B1. So the first thing that we need to know about are the cells. Now, hopefully we do remember that we've got two different types of cell. You've either got prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are the bacterial ones, whereas eukaryotic cells are the plant and animal cells. So you may be asked to actually compare or say how you could identify whether a cell was prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So for our prokaryotic cells, three key things to know about them. First, they've got no nucleus. Second, they're very simple cells. And third, their size is one micrometer to 10 micrometers. If we then compare that to the eukaryotic cells, then they do have a nucleus. They're more complex in their nature and they're larger in size from 10 micrometers to 100 micrometers. We do need to be able to label those cells. So our animal cell, first of all, has four parts. So we've got the mitochondria, which are like the little spots you can see there, the nucleus in the center, cell membrane goes around the outside, and then the cytoplasm. So four parts in our animal cells that hopefully we do remember going back to the work we did at primary school, well, probably primary school these days, actually, yes. The next cell is our plant cell. So we've got a few more parts in this one. So we do still have those same parts from the animal cell. So we've got the nucleus, the cell membrane, the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. But we've got some additional features. We've got the cell wall all the way around the very outside. We've got the chloroplasts and we've got the vacuole in the center as well. They could ask you to identify features that are only in plant cells or the features that are in animal cells and obviously just talk about the difference between them there. The next thing they could ask you to do is to talk about the functions of those subcellular structures. So hopefully we do remember that the nucleus is the bit that's going to control the cell's activities and it contains all of the genetic material. The cytoplasm is where the chemical reactions take place. The cell membrane is gonna control what enters and leaves the cell. The mitochondria are where aerobic respiration takes place. And the reason for that is that they've got the enzymes for aerobic respiration. The cell wall is made of cellulose and its whole purpose is to make the cell rigid and it helps to support it. So plants can grow vertically without a skeleton there. They've got the chloroplast, which contains that green pigment called chlorophyll, which is used to trap the light energy needed for photosynthesis. And we've got the vacuole, which contains cell sap to help keep the plant rigid and support it. For those of you doing AQA, you also need to know there are ribosomes in those plant and animal cells as well, which are the site of protein synthesis. In terms of the prokaryotic cells, then what we find is a few more features. OK, so this is a typical prokaryotic cell. So we do have the genetic material, but remember there's no nucleus. It forms this free floating loop of DNA. You've got the cytoplasm still, we've got the cell membrane still, and they do have a cell wall. But then we've got some other features that are only present in our prokaryotic cells. So these little hairs sticking off the outside are things called pili, and they're all to do with adhering to other cells. We've got the slime capsule, which goes around the outside here, and we've got these little loops of DNA called plasmids as well. The last thing we've got are the flagella, which are these long tails that are sticking off the back end there. Now, what we actually find when we're thinking about bacterial cells is they're really small. OK, so about one micrometer in size in a lot of cases. If we want to grow them in a lab, then we need to use something called an agar plate. So that's that weird little Petri dish with a jelly like stuff. that You probably stuck your fingers on in order to grow what was on your hands. Now, that agar actually contains all of the nutrients that the bacteria need in order to survive and grow. If we think about the actual function of those different subcellular structures in our prokaryotic cells, then genetic material, hopefully pretty self-explanatory. It's going to contain all of the genes required. The cell membrane, same thing as in our eukaryotic cells, controls what can enter and leave the cell. 
cytoplasm, still where the chemical reactions take place. But the cell wall, this time, is made of a different substance called peptidoglycan, and that holds the cell together and protects it. Those flagella that we saw sticking off the back, they're all to do with allowing the cell to move through liquids. The pili, those little hair-like structures sticking off all the way around the outside, those allow it to actually attach to other structures and it transfers genetic material between those different cells as well. The slime capsule, that has the whole purpose of protecting the bacteria from drying out and it also allows it to stick to smooth surfaces, yeah, like your classroom desks and things like that. And then our plasmid is that little loop of DNA, so circular DNA, that will store extra genes, particularly things like antibiotic resistance. Now, the next thing is the light microscope. So something you've hopefully had a chance to use in lessons and something you've hopefully learned the names of the different parts of because they could ask you to label it. So in terms of our key features then, what we actually have at the bottom here is the light. Now, if your school's actually got a little bit of cash, you've probably got a little light. If your school doesn't have so much money, it's probably a broken little mirror held on by a bit of blue tack. We've then got our two focusing dials here. So we've got the fine focus and the coarse focus. We've got the big black area here, which is the stage where we put the slide. And then we have two lenses, the eyepiece lens, the one you look through, and the objective lens, which are the ones you can twist around to change to different magnifications. Now, we use light microscopes most frequently in terms of school settings because they're cheap at the end of the day. Now, what we can actually do is observe these small structures in detail. So you probably did the experiment where you were looking at onion cells or maybe your own cheek cells. And the way it works is that as that light from the bottom passes through the specimen up into the eyepiece, it allows you to see what's actually in there. And those two lenses that we've got are going to magnify it so you can see a lot more detail than just trying to look at it with your naked eye. If they ask you to calculate the total magnification, then all you need to do is multiply the eyepiece lens magnification by the objective lens magnification. So a nice simple calculation for that one. This is one of those assessed practicals that you need to know how to use a microscope. So when we're actually talking about using it, first thing you do is move the stage to its lowest position. You select the objective lens with the lowest magnification, put your slide onto the stage, and then you turn the coarse focus dial until you can actually see the object. Once you've actually got it in view, use the fine focus dial to make it nice and clear. And all you then need to do, if you want to increase the magnification, twist the objective lens around to the next, and then just repeat the focusing steps. They could ask you a maths question here as well in terms of working out the size of either the image or the actual specimen. So what you actually need to do there is remember that the magnification is the image size divided by the actual size. Now, if they actually give you one of these questions, number one, take a ruler into the exam, okay? Because we're probably not gonna have endless rulers throughout every exam hall in the country, so make sure you have a ruler. Then measure it carefully. Don't just randomly flip the ruler onto the page and get a vague estimate and go with that, because we're actually quite picky about what we will accept in terms of the final number. So measure it really carefully and show you're working, because even if you fail to use a calculator for whatever reason, then you are still going to have the opportunity to get some of the marks. Before we can actually um, use our microscopes, then what we need to do is stain them. Because what we find is that many of the cells we want to look at are actually colorless. So what we actually do is we use this chemical called a stain, don't call it anything else, just a stain, in order to color either the whole cell or just particular subcellular structures there. And there's three of them that you do need to know. So the first one is a stain called methylene blue, which is the one that we use in animal cells to make the nucleus easy to see. Second one is iodine, which is what we use in plant cells to make the nucleus easier to see. And the third one is crystal violet, which stains bacterial cell walls. In order to apply the stain, it's quite simple. You get your cells on the slide, you add one drop, one drop only is all we need of the stain to it and then we place a cover slip on top. 
Now, they do like to ask you about that cover slip every once in a while. So that little tiny square bit of very flimsy glass that you probably broke several of, that is a cover slip. And what we do is we lower it down very gently using either the tip of a pen or a needle. So you just gently lower it down and then you just give it a very gentle tap to remove any air bubbles. OK. When we're thinking about microscopes, then what we need to do is consider one very important key term, which is resolution. Now, when we're talking about the resolution, we're referring to the smallest distance between two points and we can still see them as separate entities. So they don't blur together. You can still see they are two separate points. What we find is with our light microscope that any structure smaller than 0.2 micrometers can't actually be seen with a light microscope. So in order to actually view these structures that are much smaller, what we needed to do was develop a new type of microscope, which is the electron microscope. So what we actually have here then is one that's going to allow us to see more detail. And that means it will reveal a lot more information for us on the subcellular structures. So that's given us a really good understanding of things like viruses. So we can now develop new drugs for it. In terms of the electron microscope, we've got two types. We've got a transmission electron microscope or TEM, and we've got the scanning electron microscope or SEM. So what we actually find here is the TEM, so the transmission electron microscope, gives us the most magnified images, whereas the scanning electron microscope produces three dimensional images of the surface. So you can really see what's going on on the top there. We will potentially be asked to compare light microscopes and electron microscopes. So if we think about the key features of our light microscope, first of all, one key advantage of them is they're cheap and they're easy to operate. They're really small and portable. So if you want to do a study in the middle of a rainforest, you can take one with you and look at the samples there and then. Their resolution goes up to 0.2 micrometers. And we can view specimens that are either living or dead in those cases. So in order to view those specimens, the sample prep is really simple. And we can actually see the natural color of the sample unless we stain it. If we think about the electron microscope, big downside, they're really expensive. And this means that we're not going to find them in every setting. In addition to that, they're really big. And that means we can't take them with us. They are fixed in a room of a university usually. Now, these do have a big advantage of having a much better resolution. So their resolution goes up to 0.1 nanometers. But the specimens have to be dead. So you can't view anything living. It must be dead. OK, what we find in order to prepare those samples, it's quite a complex process. And we can only produce black and white images. If you want color, you can add it later using a computer. But everything you generate will actually be in black and white. So the next thing we need to move on to then is DNA. Hopefully, we do rem remember that DNA is that genetic material. So in our eukaryotic cells, that's found within the nucleus. And it's organized into these structures called chromosomes. And if we look at those chromosomes and break them into small little sections, then those sections of DNA are the genes. And each gene we've got will code for a protein. What you find is that each of you has completely unique DNA. OK, there is an exception to that, which is, of course, in the case of identical twins. Everyone else in the entire world has a unique genetic code, so a unique strand of DNA. When we're actually looking at the genes themselves, then not every single gene is switched on in every single cell. So if you're looking to see why a particular region of your body will make white blood cells, but another region will make skin cells, even though they've all got exactly the same DNA code within the nucleus, it's because some genes are switched off in order to stop them making certain proteins. So they only switch on the genes of the ones they actually want to make. Everything else is switched off there. If we think about the structure of DNA, then DNA is a biological polymer. So it's a polymer we find in living things. And what it is is two strands that are all twisted around in this shape called a double helix. And they're held together by hydrogen bonds in the middle between those bases. They're made of a structure called a monomer. And the monomers are the nucleotides. 
The nucleotide itself is made up of three key parts. The first one is the sugar, which is deoxyribose. The second is the phosphate group. And the third bit is the base, which is either adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine, so A, T, C, or G. What we then find is that those nucleotides are going to join together to make a sugar phosphate backbone. So a sugar joins to a phosphate, joins to a sugar, to a phosphate, and so on, all the way down. And then the two strands link together by those bases through a process called complementary base pairing. So this is where A always pairs with T and C always pairs with G. So remember, pointy letters A and T together, curly letters C and G together. Now, for those of you doing higher tier biology, then you do need to know how we make proteins as well. So what we've actually got then is a two stage process in our protein synthesis. So it's split up into transcription and translation. So what we have, first of all, then, is transcription. So in transcription, then, what we actually see is we start off with the required gene being copied. And for this to happen, the DNA is going to unzip. So you can see there's the double helix, and it unzips to expose the bases. Now, once we've got that, then the free bases, so what we find is we've got these free RNA bases, that are going to come in and complementary base pair in order to make a structure called mRNA. Now, the key thing about this is that we're not going to have any thymine. So there's no Ts in RNA. Anytime you want to join something to an adenine on our DNA, so in here you can see there's an adenine, but in our mRNA it's been replaced with a U. Okay. So anytime it's an A in the DNA, joins with a U in the RNA. Once we've actually made our mRNA, then that detaches from the DNA and leaves the nucleus through one of the pores where it then travels to a ribosome. So that first bit is transcription. Once it gets to the ribosome, it undergoes the process called translation. So what we find here is that our mRNA, there it is, actually has this sequence of bases and they're split up into little sequences of three, so called a triplet codon, okay? So three is triplet and the codon is just the name we give to it. And what we actually find is as it passes through the ribosome here, then it reads the bases in those triplet codons and it matches it with a complementary sequence. Now, those complementary sequences are attached onto specific amino acids and then those amino acids join together in a chain and that makes our protein. So the key thing about this is that the sequence of those triplet codons in our mRNA is going to tell us which amino acids join on in which sequence, and therefore it determines what protein we actually make. Next thing we're going to have a look at is for everyone again, and this is enzymes. So enzymes are a protein at the end of the day. And this is going to be an important thing to remember, because when we come to look at their structure, it all ties in to what we've just talked about there with protein synthesis. So what we actually find is that the enzyme itself folds up in a very specific way based on, obviously, which amino acids it's got. And as a result of that, we end up with a very particular shape of something here called the active site. Now, the active site is really important because that's where the substrate is actually going to join to the enzyme and allow it to work. If that active site doesn't match the substrate, it can't join, it doesn't work. So what we actually find the purpose of enzymes is to act as something called a biological catalyst. So this just means they're going to speed up reactions in living things. The enzymes that we have in our body are all specific to a particular substrate. So the active site will only bind with one of them. Now, this is all explained in something called the lock and key hypothesis. So this is just something as simple as when you've got a key, it fits one particular lock. And that's all we're talking about here. You've got an enzyme with an active site that fits one particular substrate. That's how it's explained. When the enzyme has joined to the substrate, we've made something called the enzyme substrate complex, and then it's going to catalyze that reaction. So it's either going to build up or break down molecules, depending on what its actual purpose is. Once it actually releases the products, that enzyme is free to crack on and do it again and again, because the key thing about these biological catalysts 
is they're unchanged at the end. So it can keep doing that over and over again. You only need a small amount of enzyme to catalyze a lot of reactions. We've got four factors that are going to actually impact on the rate at which these enzyme catalyzed reactions occur. Temperature, pH, enzyme concentration, and substrate concentration. So we've got those four that we need to know. The one they're more likely to ask you about is temperature, because you can say more about it. So in the past, they've asked six mark questions about this. Now, this is our typical temperature graph, because what we can see is as the temperature increases, then initially we get an increase in the enzyme activity. The reason behind that is that as you increase the temperature, then those particles gain kinetic energy, there's more frequent collisions, and therefore the reaction is going to happen more quickly. When we get to this top point here, the very, very peak of our graph, that is the optimum temperature. So that's where it's working as quickly as it possibly can. If we keep increasing the temperature beyond that point, then you can see that the rate of reaction decreases quite considerably. And that's because as we go past here, what we're doing is we're denaturing the enzyme. So by denaturing, all we actually mean is that it's going to change the shape of the active site. So if you heat things up too much, particularly those proteins, then it breaks down their structure. So we change the shape of the active site. The substrate no longer fits. Enzyme does nothing. The next one is pH. So very clear bell-shaped graph here. And what we see is either going to too acidic or too alkaline conditions, then we denature the enzyme. The optimum pH is going to vary depending on which enzyme we're talking about. If it's an enzyme that's designed to work in your stomach, then its optimum is going to be around about pH 2 because that's the conditions in your stomach. Whereas if it's designed to work somewhere like in your mouth, then it will have more of a neutral pH. So you'll find that the optimum pH can vary in enzymes depending on where they're actually designed to work. Next factors that we've got then are the enzyme and the substrate concentration. So our enzyme concentration, first of all, what we see is it increases initially and then a dramatic drop off because we've used up all of the substrate. So it can't keep increasing endlessly. Whereas with our substrate concentration on this side, you can see it increases initially. But then where that X is, that basically means that every single enzyme has its active site filled with a substrate. So we then get it plateauing or leveling off because there's literally no more enzymes available. Now, when we're actually thinking about enzymes, don't get thrown by the unfamiliar circumstances. So a few years ago, they put in a question about fireflies. And then as soon as the exam finished, all the students took to Twitter, ranting at their science teachers for not teaching them about fireflies. It was just an enzymes question. It really doesn't matter what weird creature or scenario they put it in. If you get a graph looking like this, then it's literally talk about enzymes and temperature. If you get one like this with a couple of lines, then it's enzymes and pH. So don't be thrown by the fact they're going to include situations that you've not been explicitly talked about. It's still just enzymes. Now, when we come on to think about enzymes, these are involved in something called your metabolic rate, okay? Now, when we're considering metabolic rate, then it's different in different people. So what we actually find is that not everyone needs the same amount of energy. And the amount of energy that you need is going to be determined by a number of factors. So your age, first of all. So you guys as teenagers will need a lot more energy than someone in their 80s who's sitting around not doing a whole lot. Your lifestyle, if you're sitting at a desk, you're not doing a whole lot compared to a builder is going to need a lot more energy there and your gender also affects. And what we actually need to consider is when we're talking about metabolic rate is the speed at which your body uses energy. So the higher your metabolic rate, the faster you're using energy, therefore the more food you're going to need to eat. When we actually talk about the food, then we've got a few key categories. So first one are the carbohydrates, which hopefully we do remember from key stage three. So carbohydrates are polymers which are made from simple sugars, and we use them for energy. If we're talking about breaking them down, then that is a carbohydrase enzyme. 
The next one is our proteins, which we've already mentioned are polymers made of amino acids. And what we actually find here is that they're going to be broken down by protease enzymes. And we use proteins in our body for growth and repair. Third one, the lipids. These are gonna be used in our body for things like energy and insulation. And they're made from three fatty acids and one glycerol molecule joined together. And because they're lipids, they're broken down by lipase enzymes. So it's really quite easy to work out the names of the enzymes because they all end in ASE. So that's how we know it's an enzyme, ends in ASE. And the first part tells you what it's breaking down. So carbohydrate is carbohydrates, okay? Prot protease, so it's proteins. So you can work it out using a little bit of logic there. Next thing we need to come on to is respiration then. So aerobic respiration is something that occurs in every single cell in your body all of the time in order to provide energy for absolutely every factor of your existence. And that's gonna be taking place inside those subcellular structures called mitochondria, okay? And the reason it happens inside the mitochondria is because they contain the enzymes. One thing you will find is that depending on which cells we're looking at in the body is going to determine how many mitochondria there are. So if you need a lot of energy in one region of your body, then those cells have a lot more mitochondria. So your muscle cells, for example, loads of mitochondria, whereas other regions of your body or skin cells, very few because they don't need vast quantities of energy there. Hopefully we do know both the word and balance symbol equation for respiration. So aerobic respiration is glucose plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. So C6H12O6 is glucose plus 6O2 makes 6CO2 and 6H2O. Good news is that that's actually going to be the same as photosynthesis, just in reverse. So if you've learned respiration, then you've learned photosynthesis as well. Key thing about respiration is that it's an exothermic reaction. So that means it's gonna give out energy, which is one of the key things about why we need it in the first place. And what we actually find is that aerobic respiration is used because it produces a lot more ATP than anaerobic respiration. So what we find is aerobic produces 38 ATP molecules, whereas anaerobic only two. So we see a 36 ATP difference between them. If we have a situation where we don't have vast quantities of oxygen, then we flip into something called anaerobic respiration, which is where glucose gets changed into lactic acid. Now, the whole reason of having this is so that we can still generate some energy, those two ATP molecules. Because if you're in a fight or flight scenario where you're trying to run from a predator, but you're running low on oxygen, you don't just want everything to shut down and you stop because otherwise you're dead. So we have this fallback mechanism of anaerobic just to give you that little bit more energy. Now, what we actually find is this could also be used in situations where oxygen isn't readily available. So certain plants that grow in waterlogged soils use anaerobic respiration. What we find is that if you've used anaerobic respiration, you've built up this lactic acid, then what we need to do is break that down because lactic acid is actually toxic to us. So that's why you get that kind of cramping and muscle fatigue is because it's a toxin. So that's your body's warning sign saying stop. And what you find is that we then have something called an oxygen debt. And that's where you keep breathing quite rapidly after you've finished exercising because you're taking in the oxygen needed to oxidize that lactic acid into a non-harmful substance. When we talk about fermentation, then this is just an example of anaerobic respiration. We start off with glucose and we're going to make ethanol and carbon dioxide. So just remember that we've got those two options there, either directly to lactic acid, otherwise we can also change it into ethanol and carbon dioxide. Next bit we need to do is photosynthesis. So photosynthesis happens in plants, okay? We as humans do not photosynthesize, we are not green, therefore it is impossible for us to do that. So what we actually find is for photosynthesis to take place, we need two key things to enter the plant. First one is carbon dioxide, and that comes from the air that's around us, and that enters the plant through the stomata by diffusion. 
The second one is water, and that's going to enter from the soil through the plant's roots through a process called osmosis. When we think about photosynthesis, it's going to take place inside the chloroplasts. So because the chloroplasts are mainly found in the leaves, that's where photosynthesis generally takes place. There are a smaller number in the stems of some plants, but the leaves is the key area. Now, the reason that they can do this is because inside the chloroplasts, we've got this green pigment called chlorophyll, and that's going to trap the light energy from the sun. And that energy then allows us to carry out the two-stage process of photosynthesis. Stage one is the light-dependent part. So that means that we are going to be using the energy from the sun to split water molecules into oxygen and hydrogen. And step two is the light independent part, which is where the carbon dioxide combines with hydrogen ions to make the glucose. So just remember those two parts, one light dependent needs the light, two light independent doesn't need it. When we think about photosynthesis, it is an endothermic reaction. We're having to take in energy from the sun. Okay, so it's endothermic. And that's been one of those one mark little tick box questions in the past. Once we've made glucose, it can be used for a wide range of things in our plant. We can use it directly in respiration. We can store it as things like sucrose in the fruits. We can use it in order to make our proteins in the long run. So just make sure you know about three different things that we can use glucose for in our plants. One of those key experiments that you do need to know about is in terms of testing our plants for starch in different scenarios. So the first thing we need to know is how you actually test a leaf for starch in the first instance. So you take the leaf from your plant, put it in a beaker of boiling water for about a minute just to kill it. Then you take the leaf and put it in a boiling tube of ethanol, and that's going to remove the chlorophyll from it. You then place the tube containing the leaf and the ethanol into a beaker of boiling water for about five minutes, making sure that there is no Bunsen burner lit at this point in time. For the simple fact that Ethanol is flammable, so if you've got a lit flame near that, it's likely to catch fire. So no lit flames at this point. Once it's been in there five minutes, you've taken all the chlorophyll out of the leaf. You can then remove the leaf, rinse it with water, spread it out on a white tile, and then add some iodine solution to it. Anywhere that starch is present, you get that blue-black colour. If it's not, it stays the orangey-brown colour. Whenever we're investigating any factor for photosynthesis, the first thing we must always do is de-starch the plant. And to do that, all you do is you take your plant and stick it in a dark cupboard for 24 hours beforehand. So when we're talking about de-starching, just chuck it in a cupboard for 24 hours and then carry out your own experiment. If we wanted to prove that chlorophyll was needed, then we use something called a variegated plant. So they're the ones with the white patches on the leaves naturally because that means that they've got no chlorophyll in those regions, but the green regions do have chlorophyll. So what we can then do is take that plant, stick it in the sunlight for a few hours, and then we test the leaf as we've just discussed. If you want to prove that light is needed for photosynthesis, we de-starch the plant, we then cover part of it with a bit of card or foil, place it in the light for a few hours, remove it, and test the leaf for starch again, and you'll find it's only present in the regions that weren't covered by the card. If you want to prove carbon dioxide is needed, de-starch the plant, cover it with a polythene bag with a little pot of soda lime in there, and the soda lime removes the carbon dioxide from within the bag. Once we've done that, in the light for a few hours, test the leaf for starch again. And then finally, if we want to prove that oxygen is given off, then we use our pondweed. So this is probably the experiment you've done in class, which may have been a little bit frustrating. So you get your little bit of pondweed, stick it in a beaker with a funnel over the top of it and a test tube sitting on top of that. Depending on the level of accuracy you did, you may have counted bubbles, in which case you've got a few issues there because number one, what we have is that when you're counting bubbles, it's really easy to miss them when they're going quit. And secondly, what we're actually going to find is that those bubbles are actually different volumes. So it's not going to give you an accurate representation of the amount of gas made. If you want to upgrade that to make it more accurate, then we can actually put a measuring cylinder upturned filled with water. And as the bubbles are produced, it will collect, push the water out, and you can read off the volume of gas produced. So that's one way you can upgrade that onto a more accurate measure of the gas made. 
do remember that when we're looking at that, you may pair it up with things like the light intensity, where you move a lamp further and further away from it and just record the amount of light, um, that's sorry, not the amount of light, the amount of oxygen given off in that time. So just think about how you can make that a little bit more accurate. And one of the factors that they like to put in there is the temperature. So if you've got a lamp shining on a beaker with your plant, then that's also going to be transferring heat energy to the plant itself. And because we've actually got photosynthesis, which is an enzyme controlled reaction, if you increase the temperature, you increase the rate. So in order to stop that, what we do is we put a beaker of water between the lamp and the actual test beaker, because that then absorbs the heat before it gets there. So just bear that one in mind. Do remember when we're talking about photosynthesis that we have something called limiting factors. Now, there are three limiting factors we need to know that are going to pretty much, as the name suggests, limit the rate of photosynthesis. So we've got light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration and temperature. So what we actually find here is if we think about light intensity, first of all, then we end up with a very clear shaped graph. So it starts by increasing and then it levels off. So at this point, increase in light intensity increases the rate of photosynthesis. But when we get here and it's leveled off, then something else is limiting it. So just remember that if they ask you about these graphs, then when you get to that flat bit, the plateau, then there is another limiting factor in that case. If we're looking at the carbon dioxide concentration, you'll notice it's exactly the same shape again. So increasing the carbon dioxide concentration increases the rate of photosynthesis, and then it levels off because there is a different limiting factor stopping it. So you're going to see the same shape for both light intensity and carbon dioxide. Okay. If we think about temperature, as we've said, photosynthesis is an enzyme controlled reaction, which means we've got our enzyme graph again. So exactly the same as what we saw previously with any enzyme controlled graph. Then as you increase the temperature, the rate increases initially because they've gained kinetic energy. Therefore, they're moving more quickly and having more frequent collisions. They get to their optimum, working at their fastest rate. Beyond that, then we denature the enzymes, active site changes shape, substrate no longer fits. So the rate drops off very quickly. So do make sure you know those three factors and how they influence it. OK. One thing that we should consider then is for those of you doing the higher tier, something called the inverse square law. So what we actually find is that if you double the distance from a light source, then the light intensity will decrease by a factor of four. OK, so the way that we represent that is one over D squared or one over the distance from the light source squared. So if you see that, that's referring to the inverse square law. So do remember that whenever we're investigating photosynthesis, then if we've got a limiting factor in terms of our amounts of either light or carbon dioxide, it does level off because something else is limiting it. Right, that's all of B1 covered. So hopefully you're all OK on that one. Next up, we're coming on to B2. I would bear in mind that we don't need to be making random comments in the chat because at the end of the day, you're here to revise. If you don't revise, go somewhere else. Otherwise, as people have said, either close the chat down or maybe pay attention so you can learn a little bit of biology before tomorrow. So B2 then. First thing is the processes by which we can actually transport substances. So first one is diffusion. So what we actually have then is diffusion is the net movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So what we find is they're moving down a concentration gradient. This is what's known as a passive process. It doesn't actually need any energy. Now, it's going to continue until the concentration gradient is zero. So that means we've got the same concentration on each side of whatever our barrier may be. Three key factors that are going to affect the rate of diffusion. First one is the distance. The smaller the distance, the faster the rate will be because it's got less distance to move. Second is the concentration gradient. So the steeper the gradient, the faster the rate. And all I mean by that is that there's a greater difference between the two sides. And the last one is the surface area. 
And that means that we've got a larger surface area than a faster rate because there's just more for it to actually move across. Second process is osmosis. So what we find here is that osmosis is the movement of water molecules from an area of high water potential to an area of lower water potential. So it's going down a concentration gradient again, and it's doing so across a selectively permeable membrane or partially permeable membrane, depending on which way you've been taught it. Again, we find that the greater the difference in water potential, then the greater the rate of osmosis. When we're thinking about osmosis, you've probably looked at it in terms of potatoes. And again, this is one of those questions they like to throw in the unfamiliar context. And again, it's the one that people moan about. Last year, I believe they used it in the context of carrots and eggs in AQA. But it doesn't matter. Osmosis is osmosis at the end of the day. If we're talking about movement of water, we're talking about osmosis. So whatever you find is when we're looking at osmosis, then it's going to be the same as your potato experiment. They might be talking about carrots. They might be talking about salt instead of sugar solutions, but it's all the same principle. So don't be thrown by that one. Now, what we actually find is in our plant cells, then we're not going to see the same scenarios as we do in an animal cell because of the presence of that cell wall. So what we actually find is that if we're actually placing it into something like distilled water, for example, then lots of water is going to be moving into our plant cells because there's a higher water concentration in the solution than in the plant cell. So water is going to keep moving in, but it gets to the point where it's all pushed out against the cell wall and it stops there. OK, if we think about that same scenario with an animal cell because they don't have a cell wall, then it just bursts. OK, so we have that process called lysis. So do remember that key difference between them. Now, third process is active transport, which is one that we see most commonly occurring in plant cell roots. Now, active transport is where the substances are going from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So they're moving against the concentration gradient. Because they're going against the concentration gradient, then we need ATP because this is an active process. It needs energy. What we actually find is, in addition to that, it also needs these structures called carrier proteins in the cell membrane. So what we find is that if we've got a cell that's actually going to need a lot of active transport, then we're going to have a lot of mitochondria present because they need energy to carry out this process. In terms of where we're going to see that, three good examples for you. One we've already mentioned in the roots of our plants, so the root hair cells there, in order to take in the minerals from the soil. Second one is in your small intestine, where we're going to be using it to get glucose. And the third one is in your nerve cells, where we've got something called a sodium potassium ion pump. And that's all to do with actually allowing nerve impulses to move. The next process we're going to look at is one that's really important in terms of cell division, which is mitosis. So when we're looking at mitosis, then this is where we're going to be seeing things occurring in our normal body cells. OK, so mitosis happens in mitoses is the easiest way to remember it. So normal body cells, it's mitosis. What we find is that in terms of your regular body cells, they're going to need to divide to repair any damaged tissue, to replace any worn out cells, and also just to let you grow. If you need more cells, they've got to divide. What we find as a result of mitosis, we get two genetically identical daughter cells. So they're clones of each other, genetically identical. In terms of how this happens, then we have this process called the cell cycle, which is the overall process of cell growth and division. Four stages to it. First one is the DNA replication stage. Second is the movement of the chromosomes. Thirdly is the cytokinesis. And then finally is the growth. In terms of the DNA replication, first of all, then we're going to start off with our DNA in that double helix. And the first thing that happens is it unwinds. So we unzip it and we've got a single stranded template then of all of the bases. The free DNA bases from in the actual cells are then going to come up and complementary base pair all the way down, A's and T's, C's and G's. And what we find is we then form two identical DNA strands. 
once we've actually got that, stage two is the chromosome movement. So what we find here is that once we've actually replicated our DNA, as we can see, then they all line up along the equator. So all of those chromosomes line up along the equator of the cell, and the equator is just the center of the cell. And then they get pulled to the opposite ends by the spindle fibers. So you can see they get pulled to the opposite ends called the poles by those spindle fibers. And then the cell is going to divide by cytokinesis and a new nucleus forms around those particular chromosomes. Cytokinesis then is just the process by which we've got our cell, we've moved the chromosomes to each end, and then the cell membrane pinches in and eventually it splits off to make two cells. Once we've done that, then what we find is that the cell's going to grow and we're then going to have two fully grown cells that are genetically identical to each other. Mitosis is one of those processes it's really important to know those stages of, so make sure you can talk about it, okay? Even if it's in the most basic terms of the chromosomes line up in the middle, they get pulled to the ends and the cell divides, that's at least gonna get you some of the marks. If you can then introduce terms like equator, pole, cytokinesis, etc., all you're doing is moving yourself further up. The next thing we need to consider in terms of our cells is differentiation. So what we actually find is that differentiation is where we're converting an unspecialized cell to become specialized to carry out a particular function. So what we find here is that we adapt cells to make them better at carrying out a particular role. And there's some good examples that you should know, things like the red blood cells, for example, not having a nucleus or the sperm cells and their adaptations like the little acrosome in the head and so forth. So make sure you do know the adaptations of a couple of those specialized cells. If we've actually got an undifferentiated cell, then that's one known as a stem cell. So if they ask you what is a stem cell, it's an undifferentiated cell, quite simply. Now, those stem cells can divide by mitosis and then undergo this process of differentiation to become any type of specialized cell. And we've got two types of stem cells we need to know. So the first one are the embryonic stem cells. So these are the ones, as the name suggests, that are found in embryos. Now they divide by mitosis and they can differentiate into all cell types, by far the most useful type of stem cell. The second, the adult stem cells, these are found in certain tissues like brain, bone marrow, your skin, so forth, and they can differentiate into some cell types. So these are the ones we're going to use to repair damage, but they can't differentiate into as many cell types as the embryonic stem cells. What we find then is that the embryonic stem cells are a lot more useful to us in terms of scientific research than the adult stem cells, because obviously the adult stem cells are limited into the number of cell types they can become. If we actually continue to look at our plants, then they've got the ability to grow and differentiate into all cell types throughout their entire lives in these key regions called the meristems. So the meristems are found in the root tips, the buds and the shoot tips, and they're capable of producing this growth throughout their entire life, differentiating into any type of stem cell, into any type of cell. The meristem cells have four key features. First one is they're small. Second, they've got very thin walls. They've got small vacuoles and no chloroplasts. Hopefully we now have a good idea about these different processes that occur in living things. And now what we're going to go on to look at is this idea of transporting substances around organisms. So the first thing we need to know about is the surface area to volume ratio. So when we're talking about surface area to volume ratio, quite simply, it's the amount of surface area per unit volume of an object. So we find that the larger an organism, the lower the surface area to volume ratio becomes. So we get to this certain point where as organisms get bigger, eventually they need something to actually give them everything they need because diffusion just isn't fast enough. So bacteria don't need any specialized surfaces because they get everything through diffusion. We can't do that, we're too big. So in order to overcome this problem, a lot of multicellular organisms have developed adaptations to increase the surface area to volume ratio at those exchange surfaces.
So one of the key ones is the good old circulatory system. Now, circulatory system, as the name suggests, is the one that's going to circulate the blood around the body. So it's made of your heart, arteries, veins, and capillaries. What we have as humans is something called a double circulatory system. So what we actually find is that blood's going to flow through your heart twice on one complete circuit of the body. So what we find is one side goes as far as your lungs, gets oxygenated and comes back. The other side, all the way around the body, and therefore delivers the oxygen to those cells. This has a massive advantage in terms of a system because the blood can be under much higher pressure on one side than the other, so that we can pump blood all the way around the body under high pressure without having a high pressure going to our lungs, which would cause damage. This is also sometimes known as a closed system because the blood just stays inside the vessels at all times, unless obviously you cut them for some reason. In terms of our blood vessels, we need to know about three of them. First one is the arteries. So arteries then are really easy to spot because they've got a thick muscular and elastic wall and a smaller lumen in the middle. So if you see something with quite a chunky wall around the outside and a little hole in the middle, you've got an artery there. So they've got that thick muscular and elastic wall to withstand the high pressure of the blood actually leaving the heart as it contracts. And it's going to allow it to expand that little bit with each contraction and then it recoils as the blood moves. The veins are very different. They've got quite a thin wall. OK, so if they ask you to compare arteries and veins, do remember to use the ER. OK, so don't just say that veins have a thin wall. That's not a comparison. You need to say arteries have a thick wall and veins have a thinner wall. Or you could just say veins have a thinner wall than arteries. But it must be a comparison. The blood is under lower pressure in the veins and the veins will have these things called valves, which stop the backflow of blood. So if you've got a tube and blood's flowing through it, you've got these little flaps of skin that allow the blood to go one way, but stop it going the other way. Third one are the capillaries then. And what we find here, this is where the exchanges are going to take place. So your capillaries are all over your entire body. And what we see is they've got these semi-permeable walls that are only one cell thick. Because they're only one cell thick, the fusion happens quickly, and therefore we get the exchanges happening efficiently. So do remember, arteries, veins, capillaries, three types of blood vessel. Arteries go away from the heart, veins come back to the heart. When we're actually thinking about blood itself, which is obviously what we're transmitting through all of these different blood vessels, then we've got a few key things we need to know is present inside our blood. So the first thing is the red blood cells, perhaps the most important part as far as this section of the course is concerned. So the red blood cell is designed to carry oxygen to all of our cells. And the way that it's actually been adapted to do this, first of all, has no nucleus. That means we can pack it full of hemoglobin and therefore more oxygen. Second, it's got a biconcave disc shape and that just increases the surface area to volume ratio. And the last one is it's actually really small, and that's small enough to fit through our capillaries. If we're thinking about a couple of key words they could use here, if you see the word oxyhemoglobin, then that is hemoglobin joined with oxygen. Deoxyhemoglobin, it doesn't have oxygen joined to it, quite simply. Second type of cell in our blood are the white blood cells. So these are the ones that are large cells and they contain a nucleus. So you can always spot them in a blood smear because they'll be the ones with the big purple blobby nucleus in there. Their whole purpose is to help us fight infections, either by making antibodies and antitoxins or engulfing and digesting the pathogen in the process of phagocytosis. Third one are platelets. This is all to do with blood clotting. So you've got platelets inside your blood so that if you cut yourself, then they go to the area and they help you form this clot that then stops you bleeding to death from a paper cut, which is quite useful. Now, it's also going to seal that wound, which means there's less chance of pathogens gaining entry and therefore you're less likely to get an infection. The last bit, the fourth bit, are the plasma, which is the straw coloured liquid that all of those cells are floating around in. And it's also going to allow other things to dissolve in there, things like the digested food, any waste products, hormones, antibodies, all of that can float through the plasma and be transported around the body too. In terms of 
the actual structure of the heart. This is a bit I know a lot of you really don't enjoy too much. And I've given you a flowchart on the video on the heart on my channel already that might help you out. But, and I apologize for dodgy printing on this one. This is your heart. So we need to be able to label the parts of the heart on here. Now, one thing that you have been asked to do on the old spec in the past, they gave you a picture, really bad picture, I'll be honest, of an artificial heart and asked you to label a couple of bits on there. The principle is the same, whether it's a real heart or an artificial heart. Think about where the blood is entering and then you can identify the chambers and work from there. So what we find, first of all, is that blood is always going to enter the heart through the vein called the vena cava. From there, it goes into the right atrium, atria at the top, ventricles at the bottom. Go with the alphabet, A before B. And from the right atrium, it goes through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. An easy way to remember that, tri, T-R-I, and right has an R-I as well. So tricuspid on the right. From the right ventricle, it goes through the semilunar valve, into the pulmonary artery, over to the lungs, picks up the oxygen, and then back to the heart through the pulmonary vein. Pulmonary just means lungs. From there, it goes into the left atrium, through the bicuspid valve, into the left ventricle, then out through the semilunar valve, into the aorta, and all the way around your body. So make sure that you do know the names of the chambers as a minimum. Atria at the top, ventricles at the bottom. And also remember not to make the very rookie mistake of thinking that when you're looking at your exam paper, that the right-hand side of the exam booklet is the right-hand side of the heart. It's not. So it's always the inverse. So imagine yourself lying on the exam paper, waving up at yourself to give you the correct side. OK. They could very well ask you to describe the journey of blood and therefore you need to know each of those stages. I always hope they won't because a lot of you don't like that as a question. But even if you can't name all of it, if you can remember that it goes atrium, then the ventricles and then through, obviously, the arteries away from the heart, you're on to a really good starting point. So do make sure you know that at the least. What we actually find then, the reason that we have those valves inside the heart is the same reason we've got them inside our actual veins, is to stop the backflow of blood. So it only allows the blood to go the right way in the heart. You also find that the left heart has a thicker muscle wall than the right because the left-hand side of the heart is pumping blood all the way around the body. The right-hand side is only going as far as your lungs. It's like right next door, doesn't have to go far. So what we find is that the right side has the thinner muscle wall because it's got less distance to go and we want to keep the pressure lower so it doesn't damage the lungs themselves. We also need to bear in mind it's not just animals that have this need to transport substances. Plants need to transport things too. So if we think about our plant transport systems next, we've got two key tissues that we need to know. First one is the xylem. And the easy way to remember what's transported in xylem is just go with the alphabet, W, X, Y, water in xylem. The xylem is going to transport water and mineral ions that are dissolved in the water there. Takes it from the roots to the stem, the flowers, the leaves, everywhere else in the plant. Now, the way that the water gets into our plant, as we've already said, is by osmosis. And the mineral ions are taken up by active transport, remember. Key things about our xylem vessel, number one, it's made from dead cells. So we've injected lignin into it and therefore it's killed those cells. There are no end walls between them, so they're not stacked up as a load of cells. It basically just forms this long straw-like tube. And that lignin is really important because it provides support. The second tissue is the phloem. And the phloem then is going to transport the dissolved sugars which we've made in photosynthesis. So do remember our balance symbol equation for photosynthesis, 6CO2 plus 6H2O makes C6H12O6 plus 6O2, the reverse of our aerobic respiration. And what we actually find is this is a process called translocation. So that's just the movement of the dissolved sugars and other food molecules. We're going to move those sugars from where they're made, mainly in the leaves, to anywhere that we need them, the roots for storage, to the merry stem, to where we can use them to make new cells, etc. In terms of our phloem, they're living cells, first of all, and the end walls have actually been turned into things called sieve plates. So basically, they're kind of like a wall with holes in. 
So it allows the sugars to pass through, but it's still present as a wall. When we think about the location of the xylem and the phloem, we've got these things called vascular bundles. So xylem and phloem are put together in a vascular bundle. Now, depending on which region of the plant we're looking at is going to determine where the vascular bundle is. So in the leaf, it forms this network, which you can see when you look at them, which then supports a soft tissue. If it's the stem, then it's around the outer edge in order to provide the support. And in the root, it's located in the very center to actually let the root bend a little bit. The next process in our plants is transpiration. Transpiration is the loss of water vapor from the aerial parts of a plant or the leaves. And what we could also see is someone referring to the transpiration stream, which quite simply is the movement of water from the roots through the xylem and out of the leaves. So any of the water that we are losing from our plant, we're going to have to actually replace. So what we have to do then is take it up through the roots again in order to replace any water lost through the leaves themselves. Now, transpiration itself is quite easy. You start off down here with our root, so you can see a root hair cell there. So water moves into our root hair cell by osmosis. It's then going to travel through the cells into the xylem, where it can travel all the way up to the leaves, and then we're going to lose it through the stomata, which is obviously surrounded by the guard cells. So that's what we're talking about when we refer to the transpiration stream, is that process of moving the water from the actual roots right the way through. Now, as we've already said, the key process here is osmosis. So again, we could see a link back to our definition from earlier on. We did mention this little structure a second ago called the stomata. So stomata, quite simply, are just the little pores, so the little holes. And then these two triangular things, they're guard cells, okay? So what we actually find is the guard cells control whether stomata are open or closed. So they surround each pore and then they'll either be nice and open, which will allow things to go through, or they're closed, stops it. What we find is when they're open, water is going to evaporate from the cells inside the leaf into those air spaces. And then we get this concentration gradient between the inside and the outside of the leaves. So water vapor then moves down the concentration gradient and out of the plant into the surrounding air. What we then find is that because we've lost water in the leaves, we've reduced the pressure in our xylem vessels, and therefore water has to move up through the xylem from the high pressure to the low pressure, i.e. from the roots to the leaves. So that's why we get that flow going up the plant there. If we think about how to reduce water loss, then on the surface of the leaves, we've actually got that waxy cuticle. So by having that, it's going to reduce water loss, first of all. If you're about as good at keeping house plants alive as I am, then you probably forget to water them quite, quite frequently. And what you find is they then wilt and look a little bit sad and pathetic. So that means that our plant is losing water faster than it's taking them in. So the leaves are collapsing and drooping for the simple fact that the vacuoles are no longer pushing out against the cell walls. So what we actually find here then is that the stomata are going to close in that instance in order to actually prevent any further water loss. Downside to that, if they're closed, we can't get any more carbon dioxide coming in. Because remember, those stomata, that's how the carbon dioxide gets in. So if it's closed, can't take in carbon dioxide, therefore photosynthesis is going to be limited as well. If we're thinking about how we can investigate transpiration, then we have this rather fancy little device called a potometer. So basically, it's got a very thin little tube here called a capillary tube, and we've got a teeny tiny little air bubble in there. We've got a measured scale on this side, and the end of the capillary tube dips into a beaker of water here. The other end, we've stuck a plant into the end of the tube. So you can set a fan up over here so it'll blow air across, and then we can watch how far that little bubble moves to record the rate of transpiration, because obviously the more the bubble moves, the faster the rate of transpiration will be. If we're thinking about the factors that affect our rate of transpiration, then we need to consider temperature once more. This is a nice simple one. It's quite simply just as you increase the temperature, then water will evaporate faster from the leaf 
and therefore diffusion will happen faster. So transpiration increases, just get a nice diagonal line. If we think about light intensity, then the stomata open in the light and close in the dark. So that means we get that increase initially, but then it will level off because when all the stomata are open, you can't increase the rate of transpiration anymore. Next two, air movement, first of all, that one does increase and then level off because as the air moves over the surface of the leaf, the evaporated water molecules are moved away from it. The faster the air is moving, the faster they're carried away. But eventually we're going to find that that again plateaus because there's only a certain rate that water can move out of our leaf. The fourth and final one is the humidity, which quite simply is the amount of water that's present in the air anyway. So if we decrease the humidity, then we get a steeper concentration gradient. So that means that water will diffuse out of the leaf faster. So remember, as you increase humidity, then it's going to decrease the rate of transpiration. So it's the opposite of our diagonal there. That's now all of B2. So now just B3 to go. So first thing we need to know about then is the nervous system. Hopefully we do remember that a change in the environment is a stimulus. The stimulus is then detected by a group of cells called receptors, and we then get a response from the effectors, which are either glands or muscles. So muscles contract, glands release hormones. If you're asked what the central nervous system is, then that quite simply is the brain and the spinal cord. We've got three types of neuron then, sensory, the relay, and the motor neuron. So sensory are the ones that go from your receptor cells to the central nervous system. Relay from the sensory to the motor neurons, and the motor neurons are the ones that go from the central nervous system to the effector. And what we find is that those neurons are bundled together to form the structures we know as nerves. If you're asked about a nervous reaction, then there's a little flow chart you really should know here. So we can have our stimulus, which is detected by the receptor, goes along the sensory neuron to the spinal cord and to the brain back to the spinal cord, to the motor neuron, to the effector, and we then get the response. And that whole process normally takes around about 0.7 seconds. So what we actually find is that you are quite amazing in the fact that your brain is capable of receiving vast amounts of information every single second. And what it's actually able to do is process all of the information it's getting from all of these different areas and it then forms something called a coordinated response. So as a result of this, it sends impulses to all the different regions of your body and allows you to then carry out some kind of a response to whatever the stimulus was. The next thing that we've actually got is a reflex action. Now, reflexes are the involuntary ones. So that's where someone sort of push their hand towards your eyes and you blink instantly. Okay, that's a reflex. You didn't have to think about that for it to occur, one would hope. And reflexes take about 0.2 seconds. So they're really quick. The actual flow chart for our reflex then, stimulus, receptor cells, sensory neuron, spinal cord with the relay neuron in it, then the motor neuron, effector and response. So we've cut out the brain part. The whole idea behind a reflex is it's involuntary. You're not having to think about it. So you can react really quickly and therefore hopefully avoid injury. For those of you doing GCSE biology, then you need to know about the eye. If you're doing combined science, you can have a momentary shutdown of your brain. In terms of our eye, we need to know the structures. So we've got the optic nerve coming off the back. The retina is the bit that lines the inside of your eyeball here. Then we've got the suspensory ligaments, which hold your lens into place, the ciliary muscle, which goes all the way around. And then we've got the pupil is the gap here. Iris is the colored bit and the cornea is the bit across the surface at the front there. So make sure you know the names of the parts of the eyeball at the least. Whole idea of your cornea is to actually refract the light. So it bends the light in order to start focusing it. As it passes through the lens, then it's further focused with the idea being it's going to focus onto the retina at the back of your eyeball, allowing the photoreceptor cells that make up the retina in order to produce that nervous impulse goes down the optic nerve to the brain and you work out what it is you're looking at. 
When we're looking at things, though, we need to focus on them at different distances. So your lens actually has to change shape to allow that to take place. So what we find is the ciliary muscle is going to be really quite important here. So it's going to contract in order to make the lens more convex or fatter. And that means you can focus on objects that are close, like reading your exam paper. Whereas it's going to allow the ciliary muscle to relax, making the lens more convex, so it gets thinner, more stretched, when you're looking at the clock at the front of the exam or wondering how long until you can escape. So we've got that different way in which we change the actual shape of our lens to change where it's focusing based on what we're looking at. Now, not everyone has perfect vision. We do have a few issues. We may be short-sighted. If you are short-sighted, then that means that things in the distance appear blurry when you look at them without glasses or contact lenses in. And the reason for that is that the lens is too strong or your eyeball is too long. So it's focusing in the wrong place. The way we correct it is with a concave lens. If you're long-sighted, then that's where the objects up close to you appear blurry. And that's because your lens is too weak or your eyeball is too short. And we can correct that with a convex lens. The third problem we see associated with the eye is color blindness, which is just where people have difficulty making out the different colors. And do remember that this is a genetically inherited condition that usually affects males. So boys are more inclined to have it than girls. When we think about the retina, that bit that lines the inside of our eyeball, then we've got two types of photoreceptor cells. So we've got the rod cells, which are the ones that let you see in low light levels, i.e. at night, but they don't respond to different colors. That's where everything looks a bit washed out at nighttime. And we've got the cone cells, which respond to different colors, and you've got different cone cells that respond to the red, the blue, and the green light. Now, once we've actually got all of this information that's been collected by the receptor cells, about all of your internal and external environmental changes, then the brain comes into play. And this is still just for the GCSE biology folks. Combined folks, you can still have your nap. Your brain is not only going to be processing all of the information from the nervous system, but also from your hormonal system. And we produce that coordinated response on all of that information that we have gathered. So what we find then is by using our brain as this central control center, then we can process things much, much quicker than if we had a control center for our right arm over here and a control center for our left arm over here. It's a lot more cohesive and therefore it's much quicker than having different regions controlled by different control centers. We've got five parts of the brain that you need to know for your GCSE. So hopefully, you can label them on this lovely little diagram, okay? So you need to be able to name our five centers on the diagram as well. So make sure you've had a little brush up on that. The cerebrum, first of all, is the one that's gonna control your complex behavior. So learning, hopefully this biology that we've gone through, you've learned some of that, that's your cerebrum you can thank. That's also the area responsible for memory, personality, and any of your conscious thoughts right now. The cerebellum, that's the one that controls your posture, balance, and any involuntary movements. The medulla, that's gonna control automatic actions such as your heart rate and breathing rate. The hypothalamus is all about regulating your temperature and water balance. And then the pituitary gland is the one that stores and releases the hormones, which we use in a huge range of different bodily functions. For those of you doing higher tier biology, then you need to know how we can study the brain as a whole. Now, what we used to do was carry out this idea of brain mapping using evidence from stroke patients because we could work out which regions of the brain control which functions. And what we could actually do in the past was take electrodes and jab them into the brain and basically see what happens when we stimulate them. So not something people particularly sign up to these days to have electrodes jabbed into their brain and electrical impulses triggered in. These days, we've got slightly better things. We've got CT scans, which use X-rays to produce three-dimensional images of the inside of the body, including your brain there. And we can then link in any odd-looking regions to the particular behavior changes that we've observed. Now, it does use X-rays, which does mean there is an increased risk of cancer, but it's still quite an informative tool.
We also have MRI scans, which use these incredibly powerful magnets to identify the brain anomalies. So that's the one that you take out all of your piercings before you get into the MRI scanner. Otherwise, it will extract them for you at that point. We can also use fMRI, which is a functional MRI. And that means that you can be asked to look at pictures or do a certain thing, and they record what's actually happening in your brain at that time. So what we can see is what's happening in real time. There are some quite clear difficulties with trying to study the brain, though. First of all, we need to get consent from the patients for information to be shared. And people may not always be willing to share that consent, particularly if they've got some rather odd anomaly with their brain. So you may have seen some people where they've actually lost sections of their skull and so forth. So it looks like they've got basically a dent in their head. So people like that may not particularly want to be these curiosities of the science. We also need a lot of case studies to draw a reliable conclusion. As always in science, if we're studying something, you need more than just one case. So the more, the more accurate it's going to be. And obviously what we're going to see is not a lot of these may exist. Each of them could be individual and therefore have different results, making it hard to draw reliable conclusions there. We may also find that several area of the, areas of the brain are involved in one particular action, making it quite hard to identify which bit's actually responsible. And then finally, we may also hit the problem of the unethical bit of our animal testing as well. If we think about the nervous system, then we've got two major systems, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, peripheral nervous system, all of the other neurons connecting into it. Now, we can see damage that occurs to the CNS or the PNS. If we're thinking about our central nervous system, then the most likely causes are injury. We could have a genetic condition or we could have something like disease or toxic substances being consumed. If we're thinking about the peripheral nervous system, then it's going to be more likely down to an injury there. Now, what we find is that damage to the peripheral nervous system can affect the sensory and the motor neurons, which means you may not be able to detect pain. You might have a certain area, you might have like a numb hand, for example. You might lose coordination. But the peripheral nervous system has a limited ability to regenerate, so minor nerve damage will often heal. Central nervous system, not so much. So if you've damaged your central nervous system, then you're likely to find that's a more permanent problem. In terms of the more serious nerve damage, we can potentially treat it through surgery by grafting nerves tissue over the damaged sections, but it's not always the case. And what we can find is that severe damage can actually lead to loss of control of body systems. You can have your partial complete paralysis, etc. And the central nervous system, as I've said, doesn't regenerate. So that's going to be permanent unless we can use surgery to correct it. In terms of how we can actually deal with brain damage, then this is particularly tricky because, first of all, it's really hard to diagnose because it's hard to work out where the actual damage is. And even if you know where the damage is, then we may not be able to access it to treat it. So if we've got some treatments that we can use, if it's a tumor, we can use radiotherapy or chemotherapy. If it's damaged tissue, we may be able to use surgery to remove it, but some hard to access regions, maybe not. And we can also insert electrodes to carry out deep brain stimulation for certain things. What we've now got is a little bit for everyone again, so combined and higher folks on the endocrine system. So first thing, hormones are chemical messengers. They're made in the endocrine glands and they travel in our blood, in the plasma of our blood. And they're going to then have a response in specific cells called the target organs. You could be asked to compare the hormonal versus nervous system controls. So if we think about hormones, they're fairly slow, but they're long lasting. They're transported as chemicals in the blood and they can target a much larger area because obviously through the blood, they reach everywhere. If we think about the nervous system, then it's much quicker, but it lasts for a shorter period of time. They're transmitted as electrical impulses along the neurons, and it allows for very precise areas to be targeted. So what we actually find there is you can give reasons why hormones are better than nerves and vice versa. 
If you're asked about homeostasis, then this is the maintenance of a constant internal environment. And what we find is that hormones are controlling these processes that need this constant fine tuning just to get them right. So what we actually find is you've got a range of endocrine glands all around your body. So you've obviously got things like your adrenal glands, which produce the adrenaline. You've got your pancreas making insulin. You've got the ovaries and testes making the sex hormones. So all of those make up your endocrine system. The target cells themselves are the cells on the target organ that have specific receptors for that particular hormone. So once the hormone binds to that receptor, we get a response there. For those of you doing higher tier, you need to know about negative feedback. So negative feedback is a control mechanism we use in homeostasis. And what we see is a very small change in one direction is detected by receptors. And then the effectors reverse that change to restore the conditions to their normal level. So you've got a nice little kind of flow chart that takes you through this. So we've got a change detected by a receptor, first of all. We then activate the corrective mechanisms with our effector. We return the conditions to a set point. We then switch off the corrective mechanisms and then the conditions will go back to changing once more. So it just goes around in this endless little loop. In terms of some of the problems that we can see here, you need to know about thyroxine first of all. So thyroxine is produced in the thyroid gland and it's all about regulating the metabolic rate of the body. So the thyroid gland actually takes iodine, which comes from your food, and converts it into thyroxine by joining it with the amino acid tyrosine. Now, the problem is, if we don't have the right level of thyroxine, then we can't control the amount of energy available to cells. So in order to control this, we've got a negative feedback system. So we start off with the hypothalamus in our brain, which detects the low level of thyroxine in the blood. TSH is released by the pituitary gland, and that stimulates the thyroid gland to make the thyroxine. That then is released into our blood, and the hypothalamus detects the normal level of thyroxine in the blood, sends a message to the pituitary gland to stop making TSH, and then that means that the thyroid stops making thyroxine. So it just goes around in that never ending little loop, okay? So hypothalamus, TSH, then we've got our thyroid gland to make the thyroxine and back to our hypothalamus again. We've also got adrenaline made in the adrenal glands, as we've said, which is all about the fight or flight response. So if you've got adrenaline in your body, then you're respiring faster, you've got increased heart rate, increased breathing rate, and you can also divert the blood away to the muscles so that you're ready to run away from that danger. So do bear in mind those two examples there of our key hormones, if you like. Next bit is for everyone. So foundation, higher, combined, biology, the whole shebang, which is the good old menstrual cycle. So hopefully we do know that the menstrual cycle is a monthly cycle that gets the body ready for pregnancy. The whole thing lasts about 28 days. Now, you should know the female reproductive system from back in about year seven there. So we've got our ovaries over here, and then you've obviously got the uterus over here. So make sure you at least can identify those two parts, if nothing else. Now, once we've actually got this, we need to understand what happens each month. So each month, the lining of the uterus is going to thicken to be ready in case an egg is fertilized. So at that same time, an egg is going to start to mature in one of the ovaries, and approximately 14 days later, it gets released from the ovary in the process called ovulation. That egg is then going to travel down the fallopian tubes, where if there is sperm present, it will be fertilized. And then if the egg is fertilized, it travels on down to the uterus, where it may implant into the lining. The reason it implants into the lining is so it's protected. It then gets all the oxygen and the nutrients it needs from the mother. If the egg is not fertilized, then the uterus lining is broken down and then it passes out in the actual process of menstruation or having your period. Four hormones we need to know to do with our menstrual cycle then. We've got the follicle stimulating hormone or FSH, estrogen, luteinizing hormone, LH, and progesterone. So these are the four hormones we need to know that are either made in the pituitary gland or the ovaries. First of all, FSH. This is made in the pituitary gland, and it's going to travel to the ovaries in the bloodstream, 
and that's the one that causes the egg to mature. It's also going to stimulate the ovaries to produce the second hormone, which is estrogen. Estrogen then made by the ovaries and it causes the uterus lining to thicken. As a result of our estrogen levels increasing, the FSH production is inhibited, so it's stopped. And that also has the bonus of stopping more than one egg from maturing, usually. Sometimes more than one does sneak out, hence why we get twins. And we also find that it's going to stimulate the pituitary gland to release LH. LH is secreted by the pituitary gland. And when the LH levels peak in the middle of the cycle, that's when ovulation occurs. So that's the egg being released as a result of the peak of our LH. Fourth and final one, progesterone. This is the one that's going to maintain the uterus lining. So it keeps that high level of progesterone right the way through the pregnancy. And it also inhibit, inhibits the LH. So those are our four hormones to do with the menstrual cycle. This is the lovely graph that they like to pull out every once in a while to do with this. Now, this looks horrible, but it's actually four graphs in one. So you've obviously got one, two, three, four graphs, and you just need to look at the side to see what it's telling you. The best way to approach anything asking you to describe anything to do with these graphs is just literally look at the top one, explain what you can see happening there, then link it into the peaks on the next and so on. So just tackle each one in turn just to work your way through it really logically so you can talk about each of the hormones and what effects they then have. Next thing we need to know about is how we can actually control reproduction because surprisingly you don't want babies all the time. What we're using is contraception here, which is any technique used to prevent pregnancy. You've either got hormonal versions, which use hormones as the name suggests, or non-hormonal, which are barrier methods, the whole idea being they prevent the sperm from reaching the egg. So a few examples here for you. Obviously, the typical condom, non-hormonal. We've got the diaphragm, non-hormonal. The IUD or the coil, again, non-hormonal. We then have the combined pill, which is the estrogen and progesterone pill. As the name suggests, it is hormonal. The progesterone only pill, again, hormonal there. The IUS, which is a hormonal one. But no matter what ones we're looking at there, we need to be able to look at a table of data and talk about how effective they actually are. Now, there were a few people last year that fell into a trap where when they're asked how effective or to pick the most effective contraceptive technique, they pick the one with the lowest effectiveness percentage. The effectiveness is how good is it at preventing you getting pregnant? You want the highest number there, okay? One thing to remember, though, is no form of contraception is 100% effective, okay? Some of them are at 99 point something percent, but it's not perfect. So do remember that none of them are perfect, and you'd have to pick the best one based on the situation. So if you've got someone who's really forgetful, you probably don't want to rely on them to take a pill every day. Next thing for the higher tier folks is understanding how we can actually use hormones to treat infertility. So what we have these days is the ability for those people who are struggling to actually conceive naturally, then we can give some help medically. So we've got a few reasons why this might be necessary. First of all, there may be blocked sperm duct, so the sperm can't actually be released. We may not be producing enough sperm, and therefore the sperm count's very low, making it unlikely that they're going to fertilize an egg. There may be a lack of mature eggs being produced in the ovaries, or the ovaries may not release an egg. So there's a range of different reasons that we could see fertility issues here. Now, what we can actually do is use these fertility treatments in order to try to counteract some of these. One of the key ones is FSH. So FSH is used as a fertility drug as it stimulates the eggs to mature in the ovaries. So it's going to trigger that production of estrogen and therefore increase the likelihood of pregnancy. Now, if that still doesn't work, then we can go one step further and use IVF or in vitro fertilization. So people who are really struggling to get pregnant, then we can go full science on them. So in that case, first of all, you go through all of the fertility drugs and produce a large number of eggs to mature at the same time. You then have the eggs collected through a surgical procedure, and then they're placed in a special solution in a Petri dish along with the sperm. 
that then allows them to actually fertilize in the Petri dish and they're allowed to just start to reproduce. So they're checked to make sure that they're selecting the ones that have started to divide. And then they're going to re-implant one or two of those fertilized eggs into the uterus of the mother. So this then allows us to implant the eggs directly into the uterus. Still not perfect, and depending on your age is going to determine how likely it is to work at different points, and it drops off quick. So it's one of those that is better if you're younger at this point. There are some issues around IVF that a lot of people don't necessarily agree with. First of all, it's not natural. So you can bring in the religious arguments here if you wish. It does mean that parents who could actually, the, uh, I'll try again. It does mean that parents who would not normally be able to have a baby can actually conceive. And that can also bring its own problems in because that means that older parents can actually have children. And some people may not agree with that. We also have the issue that because they are implanting potentially two of those little embryos, then what we find is that that can result in multiple births. So kind of a buy one, get one free, which is quite nice. Your next problem, it's expensive. You are talking about a minimum, and I mean minimum, of £5,000 for one of these cycles. So if you're thinking about the fact it's not a guarantee, that's a lot of money to try once for a baby. So bear in mind, it's expensive. You can get it on the NHS, but it's limited. And some will say you can only have two or three tries and then you're on your own. Obviously, it does have a big advantage that if you actually want to focus on your career first and have a family later, gives you the opportunity for that. But as we've said, it's not perfect. For those of you doing GCSE biology, we need to know about plant hormones as well. So a tropism is a growth in response to an external stimulus. And this means that plants can also respond to their environment. They don't just sit there and do nothing. They do respond to everything around them. What we see is the most common one is phototropism, growing towards the light with the leaves. And we also see gravitropism, which is allowing things like the roots to grow into the direction of gravity and the shoots to grow away from gravity. One of the key plant hormones is auxin. Now, the one bit of advice I generally give my students is if in doubt about an actual plant hormone, just write auxin, because a lot of the times you're going to be right. Now, auxin is made near the tips of the roots and the tips of the shoots, and then it diffuses back from there into the other regions of the plant. Now, what we actually find is that the auxin stimulates the shoot cells to grow, but it will inhibit the growth of root cells. So if we think about phototropism, first of all, then what we're actually looking at here is the plant's response to light. So we start off with our little plant and what's going to happen is, and you have to excuse my really poor drawings. So we've got our actual plant stem here. Okay, so this is our little shoot. Now, if we've got our light coming from one side, then the auxin starts at the tip and diffuses down. And what happens is it's going to collect on the shaded side. And that means those cells on the shaded side, this side, are going to grow faster than those on the light side. And that means it bends it towards the light. So what we see is positive phototropism growing towards the light, negative phototropism growing away from the light. If we think about gravitropism, positive gravitropism means it grows in the same direction as gravity, down, and negative gravitropism grows in the opposite direction to gravity, up. So what we see is the roots are going to demonstrate the positive gravitropism going into the ground, whereas our shoots, negative gravitropism, up into the air. We do need to know about the uses of our hormones in plants. So auxins, we can use to stimulate the growth because they cause cell elongation, and we can also regulate fruit development. If we think about ethene, which is a gas, then we can cause fruit to ripen, and we can also stimulate that conversion of the starches into the sugars there. And then finally, the third one, the gibberellins, promote growth, particularly stem elongation, and the end the dormancy of our actual seeds and buds. If we want to kill weeds, then we use a weed killer, okay, which has a selective herbicide. And the reason they're selective is they contain auxins. So you can see why I'm saying we're going to put auxins down for a lot of things here. 
they're going to kill any of these broad leaf plants, but not the narrow leaf plants. So it'll kill things like dandelions, but leave your grass alone. And the reason they do that is it makes the weeds grow way too fast and kills them. If we want to promote the growth of roots, then we use a rooting powder, which again contains auxins. So you dip it into the powder and then roots will grow from your cutting. If we want to actually delay the ripening of fruit on our fruit trees, we can spray them with auxin. And that means we can then collect the whole harvest at the same time, preventing any of them dropping early and therefore losing some of our crop. If we want to ripen fruit quicker, then we spray it with ethene, not auxin this time. And that means that we can actually get fruit ready earlier in our growing season there. We do also have the ability to make are seedless fruit these days. So seedless grapes are a key example here in something called Parthenocarpi. And again, it's auxin. We're going to apply auxin to our unpollinated flowers, and then they're going to produce the fruit without any seeds because they weren't pollinated. Therefore, they can't make a seed at this point. We can also control dormancy because we can spray the seeds with gibberellins or auxins to trigger the germination so we can grow them whenever we want. Next one is our body temperature. So back to humans again. So in order to control body temperature, hopefully we know human body temperature is 37 degrees and we need to keep it that temperature because of the enzymes. If you get too cold, your core body temperature is going to drop, enzyme reactions occur too slowly and cells are going to begin to die. So less than 35, you're at risk of hypothermia. If we get too hot and our core goes above 40 to 42 degrees, then enzymes can denature and that can lead to death. So body temperature needs to be around 37 Celsius. In order to control this, we've got receptor cells in our skin that monitor the external temperature and we've got internal receptor cells to monitor the temperature of your blood. All of that info is sent to your thermoregulatory center in the brain. And if we detect a change in temperature, then impulses get sent to the effectors to bring everything back to normal. So again, we've got homeostasis here. Now, if we're too hot, then what we find is the body hairs are going to lay flat <coughs> in order to stop any air getting trapped against the skin. And that's important because air is a good insulator. We also find that sweat glands will produce sweat because as that water evaporates, it transfers energy to the surroundings and vasodilation occurs. So that's going to increase the blood flow through the capillaries, meaning more heat is lost as radiation. If we go with when we're too cold, body hairs rise up to trap the air against the skin. We don't sweat and we get vasoconstriction. So it's kind of the opposite. And we'll also shiver, which means that we respire faster in those cells and release extra energy. For everyone combined, higher foundation and the biologies, then we need to know how to control blood sugar levels. So glucose is released from your food dur during digestion and it moves from the small intestine to the bloodstream. So glucose is that energy store that we need. Now, what we actually need to do is put that through respiration in order to generate the ATP, obviously, but we can't have vast quantities of glucose circulating through our blood all of the time. So what happens is the pancreas is going to detect when the blood sugar levels are too high and release the hormone insulin. That then has its effect on the liver, which is its target organ, and it triggers the conversion of glucose into glycogen for storage. If we then obviously got our stored glycogen, then we have a second hormone called glucagon that then triggers the glycogen to be converted back into glucose when we need it. One of the key problems we can find is our inability to control our blood sugar levels. So we've got diabetes here, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is where we can't produce insulin, so our immune system has destroyed our pancreatic cells that make it. And in order to control that, you need the insulin injections. Type 2 is the one that normally comes on later in life and has that strong link to obesity. And what we actually find is that it's not effectively using insulin in our body. So you may be able to control it by eating a balanced diet and exercise, or you may have to use the injections. Last thing we need to come on to is the kidney. So this is just for the GCSE biology folks. Combined folks, you're done. For the GCSE biology folks, we need to know about the kidney and how it's used to maintain water balance, which I'll try to get through in the next 10 minutes. So first thing we need to know is 
that if too much water is present in your blood plasma, then the blood cells are going to burst or undergo lysis. And that's bad news. We don't want popping blood vessels everywhere. Now, what we find is if there's too little water present, also bad news because our blood cells are going to shrink because the water's moving out of them, again, making them less effective at doing their job. When we're thinking about big waste product as a result of our controlling water levels, that's urine. So that quite simply is a solution containing water, urea, and other waste substances. And the key thing there is the urea, because that's, again, another toxic chemical. It's filtered out of our blood by the kidneys, and then it's taken to the bladder where it's stored before you go to a toilet. Now, when we're actually thinking about what happens when you're short on water, then you actually produce very little urine and it's really concentrated. Whereas if you've got a surplus of water, you produce large quantities of urine that's very dilute. So this is where you can actually stand and look at the color of your wee and determine how dehydrated you are or not. So obviously it should be a relatively light color. That's the ideal. When we think about the kidney then, what we have are three sections to it. So what we find is you've got your cortex, the medulla, and the capsule, which is the outside bit. Now, the capsule is the outer membrane, which helps keep it in shape and protect it from damage. The cortex is the outer part, and then the medulla is the inner part of the kidney. Each kidney itself contains about one million nephrons. So the top of that nephron is found in the cortex, and the lower section is found in the medulla. What we see is the blood is going to enter our kidney under high pressure through this thing called the renal artery. So renal always through the kidney. And each branch of the renal artery leads to the structure called a glomerulus. Each glomerulus then contains a knot of capillaries. So you've basically got this little structure with this knot of capillary sitting in it like so. So as the blood comes in here, it's under really, really high pressure. So that's going to push all of the small molecules like the urea out through the capillary wall and into this structure that is sitting in called the Bowman's capsule. So any large molecules that are too big to fit through the capillary wall stay in the blood, okay? So they're just carried elsewhere. So this is the ultra filtration part. So what we're doing is we're using high pressure to push the tiny molecules out of the blood into the Bowman's capsule. Big things stay in the blood. That filtrate then goes through the nephron tubule and all of our glucose is reabsorbed, as well as some of the water and any of the salts that we may still need in our body. So because we're only absorbing certain things, that is selective reabsorption. The filtrate then continues on through the loop of Henle and the collecting ducts, which is where any extra salt and water are reabsorbed as needed. So it will vary depending on what your actual body needs are. In order to actually control this whole thing and determine how much urine you're making, then we use a chemical called ADH, it's a hormone. So what it actually does is that ADH makes the walls of the collecting ducts more permeable to the water. And again, you've got another little negative feedback flow chart that you can learn about that one. But the key thing is your hypothalamus detects the water potential of the blood, and then the pituitary gland will either release more or less ADH, depending on if the concentration is too high or too low. And that then tells the kidney to absorb or not absorb the water. So just make sure you know how that works. Do remember that in that scenario where you are actually seeing a lower water potential, then you are going to have your first response triggered. And therefore, your body's going to say, drink some water. Hopefully, you will listen to that and drink it. Otherwise, if you ignore that signal, then you risk dehydration. And if you get too dehydrated, then death it is. First stages of dehydration will be lack of energy, headache, dizziness, and your dark concentrated urine. And if you prolong that for any length of time, then you're going to do damage to your kidneys and liver and potentially die as a result. So drink water. Do remember that if you've got an excess of water, then your blood plasma water potential is going to exceed the cells. So that means we're going to see problems there. If we actually consume a large quantity of water really rapidly, then the water moves into your cells by osmosis, which can cause that lysis, as we've already discussed. It's also going to potentially mess with your concentration of sodium. And that means you can end up with seizures. So not a good thing. 
Very last thing I'm just going to mention then are just three terms to know in terms of osmosis. Hypertonic, which is where we've got high levels of glucose and salts. Hypotonic is low levels of the glucose and salts. And isotonic is where they're meant to be equal to that of blood plasma. So just be, bear those in mind in case they ask you a question about sports drinks or something random at the end. That is all of B1, 2 and 3 for OCR and also a lot of the AQA as well. Obviously, for those of you doing AQA, then, as I said at the start, I haven't covered anything on the diseases, but I didn't have time to do all of that tonight, obviously. Hopefully you found this useful. And if not, then there's always some other videos on my channel as well that you can go and have a look at those key areas you're not sure of. Again, we'll be back on Wednesday night for the chemistry live seminar for the C1, 2 and 3. So we'll be back at hopefully 6 o'clock. I do have a meeting before that, so I will be trying to get back here for 6. If I'm not here exactly at 6, then I'll be just a few minutes after. But we will be there for the chemistry on the Wednesday. And then we'll have the physics next week sometime, but no need to worry about that yet. Key thing for tomorrow, folks, just remember, go in, do your best, read the questions, and obviously answer all of them, because a blank space will get you no marks at all, whereas at least if you have a guess, worst case scenario, you'll entertain your examiner. Best case scenario, you'll pick up some marks. So do remember to go and have a little look through anything you're not 100% sure on, and make sure you do get some sleep tonight, because there's no point in staying up all night trying to revise. So good luck for tomorrow, everyone, and I hopefully will see you all again on Wednesday night.